Uh, last week, we began this series, uh, this kind of part one series in the book of Judges. Um, and we'll be in for a couple of weeks. We'll go through half the book, and then later this fall, we'll go to part two, and we'll do groups again later this fall. Um, so I encourage you, if you're not perhaps already in a group, there'll be another whole sign-up thing in, a, in, in, in several weeks, and, and we'll talk about that when it comes. But, uh, but last week, as we started the book of Judges, this book in the Old Testament, we learned together this story of what God's Word shares with us, that, that there was a time where, where the you know, people of God were being led by Moses, and you know, through the Red Sea, out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, and towards the Promised Land, all the stuff that we talked through last week. And then there comes a time where change happens, where, where Moses is then followed by a new leader named Joshua. And Joshua takes the people into their new home. They cross the Jordan River, much like where God uh, held up the waters of the Red Sea. The Lord held up the waters of this enormous river, larger than the canal right here, this enormous river that the Lord held up so the people of God could follow Joshua on to the other side. And, and through the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, we hear this story, we know the story of them conquering, having victory over all this land, and then towards the end they uh, kind of you know, dissect it and say, here's, you know, for this tribe, here's for this tribe, here's for these people. But during that time, when we talked about this last Sunday, there's this very important detail that God made so clear to them. It wasn't hiding in the fine print in the footer somewhere or in an appendix added on later. It was big and bold, very clear up front. The Lord said, don't let any of these people who are already here stay with you. All of the other nations and tribes and kingdoms who are inhabiting this land, they have rituals and practices and religions and ways of life that are very, very toxic and evil and bad. And they will ruin you. Do not let them stay here with you. They must go. Well, what we talked about last Sunday, they didn't quite listen. What could be the harm if they lived here next to us, if they lived across the street and our kids went to the same school, what would be the harm? What would be the harm? Well, their choice to keep what God told them to remove close cost them everything. We talked together last Sunday that God can't bring in something new if you are clinging to what he said to let go of and to remove from your life. It was a heavy Sunday last week. I encourage you um, if you perhaps missed last week's conversation, listen to it, whether it be on Facebook or YouTube or even on the app, um, on the church app, the podcast recording that's there. Listen to it on your way to work um, on Tuesday. Um, but friends, as we continue in this story, as we are building on last week, as Joshua and this entire generation have now passed and now they're kind of their successors are, are leading and now stepping in. They have now, we've discovered last week, they're now these people who don't really acknowledge God and they don't really anymore celebrate or honor his provision, protection, and blessing. You see, as we turn the page from Judges chapter 2 and Judges chapter 3, we see again this kind of state of, of, of the union, how things are happening among the people of God. So he says in chapter 3, verse 1, I encourage you to follow along on the screen. We'll read a couple of verses together, also in the church app or in a Bible in your hand. But it says this, it says, These are the nations the Lord left in the hand, listen, to test. Perhaps if you're in your phone or Bible, underline that or highlight it. Land to test those Israelites who had not experienced the wars of Canaan. He did this to teach warfare to generations of Israelites who had no, had no experience in battle. These are the nations, the Philistines, those living under the five Philistine rulers, all the Canaanites, all the Sidonians and the Hivites living in the mountains of Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon to Lebo Hamath. And these people were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the commands of the Lord had given to their ancestors through Moses. We'll discuss this, this moment more in our groups this coming week, so look forward to that. But, but this is a very important description of what is happening. Because the Lord says that I want to test them. And this is something that we, even as the people of God, thousands of years later, we talk about this in our journey of faith, this testing 
from God. And most certainly the Lord at times in our life, whether we realize it or not, or perhaps we don't know it until later on, we go through seasons where the Lord allowed hardship or allowed challenge, where we experience something that, that we can certainly show to God that we're following him. But this testing is different. This is one that perhaps we are a lot more familiar with, but we don't quite talk about it as much. While we say testing as a way to describe it, it's, it's a different, more self-inflicted battle of the wills where God says, okay, let you just discover on your own. It's almost if God and the people of Israel are sitting in the driver's seat at the same time and they're fighting over the steering wheel of which way to go. And the Lord just said, okay, you won't listen to me, then fine. Let's see if you can handle this on your own. The Lord even said in verse 2, I'll let them go and experience warfare again because it's in warfare that they will remember that I am powerful. And that I love to take care of them. But they are stubborn at times. And as we even say now today, there is no atheist in the foxhole. Perhaps they need to be reminded of that. So God says, okay, I'll let these, these people stay because you want them to stay. But just so you know, they will be a great, great test for you. And he doesn't tell them now, but what we discover throughout the rest of Judges is they don't pass the test. They realize that they are not able to control the car on their own. See what happens next in verse 5 is they choose to begin to make a decision. And it's actually this, this kind of stumbling block, this domino we begin to fall that actually reoccurs over and over and over again throughout the rest of the book of Judges that we will read over and over and over again. Verse 5, it says this, So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and they intermarried with them. Israelite sons married their daughters, and Israelite daughters were given in marriage to their sons, and the Israelites served their gods. Verse 7, The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They forgot about the Lord, their God, and they served the images of Baal and the Asherah poles. And then the Lord burned with anger against Israel, and he turned them over to King Kushan, Rishathaim, of Aram, Neharim. And the Israelites served Kushan, Rishathaim, for eight years. Now, did you notice what happened? They worshiped other gods. They lived out and did evil things that, that the Lord said, this is so bad for you. Please do not do this. But they did it anyway. The Lord got angry with them and handed them over to allow them to be oppressed by a king. But did you notice what happened first? Do you notice the very first thing that was described of what they chose to do? Is that they intermarried with the other kingdoms. This is very important for us to understand. They chose to build homes. Not, not only did they say, hey, go ahead and, and, and live across the street. Hey, we can kind of share community with each other. But now it's progressed. Now they have chosen to build homes and families with one another. The people of God have built families with people who hated their God. A woman would marry a man who wanted nothing to do with her God. Men of God would marry women who rejected the Lord. And they together would have kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. And spiritual confusion would, would, would thrive in this ecosystem of family trees. Church, understand that this is the second domino. That the people of God, as they are teetering over the edge and leaning away from the Lord... They've already said, God, we're not going to listen to you. We're going to let these people stay. But now they've said, let's join our lives together. Allow our faiths, allow our religions, allow our ideas about life, our ideas about everything, our culture, our rituals, allow them just to be blended together. But understand what the people of God failed to realize. What God was trying to bring to their attention 
we try to br- blend together the way of the world and the way of God, they do not coexist with each other because the way of the world hates the way of God. And when you try to blend it together to make everyone happy, you get homes and family trees filled with poison of pluralism and is absolutely empty of God's presence and peace and power. And then the very king of the people who they chose to marry, all these people that they chose to marry were at one point belonging to this king's kingdom. And so now they all begin to marry each other and then they're surprised that this king now says, you know what, I want to overrule you and I want to oppress you. And they did for eight years. And then God raises up the first judge. And now understand, (laughs) we are about to read a very short few verses about my favorite judge in the book of Judges. And I'll tell you why he's my favorite. Because understand, God picked him for a very important reason. It says this in verse 9 in chapter 3, But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Othniel, the son of Caleb's youngest brother, Kenaz. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he became Israel's judge. He went to war against King Kushan Rishathaim of Aram, and the Lord gave victory to Othniel over him. So there was peace in the land for 40 years, and then Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. Othniel is probably one of the least talked about judges in the entire book of Judges, because there's not any apparent powerful, miraculous thing that takes place. There's no wool fleece. There's no cool tent peg through the you know, temple kind of part of the story. There's no divine strength that's given to conquer whole armies with the jawbone of a donkey. There's, there's none of that in his story. But understand is that the Lord didn't pick him for one of those reasons. You see, understand, God raised up this man not just because of his success as a military leader, but because about his, his inner life and about his home life that he had created that honored God. Understand is that in this moment, God raises up a judge who not only wins the battle, but whose home life would be an example for all the people. In a day and time where everybody was, was mirroring and joining together with other cultures and religions and, and they were seeing all this toxicity pool up around Othniel, when he saw all of that amongst his peers, Othniel married a great woman named Aksa, whose father is Caleb. Now Caleb is one of the original 12 spies who with Joshua went and saw the people, I'm sorry, went and you know, uh, investigated the promised land. And they came back. That's why Joshua was risen up as the successor of Moses. But understand, Caleb wasn't ignored. Caleb was a saint of the faith. Him and Joshua together were revered as great men of God up until the end of their life. Great men of God. And as Caleb reached that season of his life when he was passing away, he made sure his daughter married a great man of God. And we read about that moment in Judges chapter 1, where Caleb says, who went and did this? I want my daughter to marry this man. Understand that sure, Othniel was celebrated for his military achievements. He was a great Strong gentleman who would have won wars and God used him in all of that. Absolutely. But his greatest purpose was to be elevated among the people as an example for what it looks like to have a family and have a home that belongs to God. That is why the Lord picked Othniel. That is why his story is told in Judges chapter 1. And then he is called here in Judges chapter 3. It's an important question that we ask of, 
you know, all this time ago in history of resources and paper and writing utensils, all this stuff was rare resources, then everything that is written is so on purpose. And as the Holy Spirit led people to write the Word of God all those years ago, everything has purpose and is brought into the Word of God. And so there is great meaning why in Judges 1 we learn about Othniel and his marriage with Aksha. And then in Judges chapter 3, God says, I want you. I want you. Church, I am convinced in this midst of our conversations, as we talk about our hearts wanting to live out God's calling in our lives, in our homes, in our families, in all of us, that we understand this very powerful reality that Othniel is trying to get across the table to all of his peers and to all of us that when our home life is made new by God, then we have for us a strong foundation that enables us to live out the fullness of our purpose in Christ. The expression of home life is defined in our culture as a person's domestic routine, way of living, their private life at home. It looks like a lot of different things for a lot of people in different seasons of life. Whether we be single or we're dating someone or we're married, whether we're parenting or co-parenting or a step-parent, or whether we're, we're, we're not one of the adults, we're actually one of the, the, the kids in the home. Perhaps we're a teenager or a young child having with our siblings and step-siblings and half-siblings. We have in our home life the environment that is all around us of our nuclear family or whatever it might be. The quality of living in our home or lack thereof, the stresses and tensions that are present among every single person or perhaps with mom and dad or even with the students and the kids. All of this is a part of our home life. The relationship dynamics with everyone, with mom and dad with each other, with kids, with mom and dad, all the things that are all crossing together like a giant spider web, the relationship dynamics with everyone, whether it be healthy or unhealthy, good or bad, and also the quality of communication and trust that is either there or it is shattered. All of these things speak to the essence of our home life, our values, our principles that we have, our routine, our ways that we discipline and raise kids. All of those things are the essence of our home life. So whether you are single or married, have kids or you don't, or living on your own or with your parents or with roommates, or whether you're a teenager or an adult, we all have a home life. And I don't want us to miss is that God is trying to make so clear is that in his choosing of Othniel, that when our home life is made new and belongs to the Lord, it truly acts and becomes a springboard into greater things that God has dreamed of moving in and through and using us. There were other judges in chapter 3. We'll read about them this week in our groups. Some of them have very cool stories. But in preparing for this weekend, I did not want us to miss out on the very first judge and what God was trying to communicate to his people. Because what also makes Othniel wonderful is that he's one of the few judges that don't fall. He's one of the few that are faithful to the Lord to the very end, and he keeps his love for his home and his people and his God first to the very end. And I say all this out loud. We talk about our home life and have this even on the screen But we get this and we hear it being said and we say, all right. Like, huh, that's neat. And perhaps, even if I may, I'd say there's even a part that says, okay, what else you got? (laughs) This is not something that is boisterous or outlandish or anything out there that we have never talked about or even never personally wrestled with before. 
This is something that perhaps we've even have wanted, even have been dreaming for, even been praying for for the last 21 days of prayer and fasting. But there's also this reality of, wouldn't it be nice? Sure, maybe someday things might be different between me and my spouse or me and my place of singleness or me with my kids or my adult kids, whatever it may be. Sure, it would be nice, and I want those things. But there is a gap between what we aspire and what is actually happening. And let me tell you what I don't want us to gloss over and miss, what I am so convinced of, is that when the Lord creates this wholeness in our home, we truly get to experience, we truly get to live out the fullness of our purpose in Christ. Sure, we can live out our purpose and meaning when things are not whole, when things are messy, when things are very broken. But understand is that we are not getting to experience the fullness of it. I've sat across the table for many, many men and women who aspire for God to, to move more through them and use them in their workplace or even use them in ministry. I've sat across and have dozens and dozens and dozens of conversations with people all the way from from later in life and all the ones still in high school. People who have had the sense of, I really want God to move in this and use me or whatever it may be. But in those conversations, I always ask them about their home life. If they're married, I ask them about their marriage. If they're dating or single, I ask them about their relationships If they have kids, ask them about their relationships with their kids. Because friends understand that we have this habit of kind of allowing that stuff to sit on the edge and thinking that we can chase after this fullness of our purpose in Christ and kind of ignore some of this. I once was at Waffle House with a man who uh, had been deeply involved in another church. He'd actually been a, a pastor, a gentleman in ministry, and and all this stuff, and he was, we were talking about all these things and our personalities. All, it was great to connect. But then I went to go ask him about his relationship with his wife. And he would tell me that they don't even live together anymore. They're not divorced. Everything is fine. And they love each other and they you know, love each other and they have their way of life. But he'd rather actually live with his friends and live with his buddy than actually live with his wife at home. And I said, whoa, 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 put the brakes on. This is so not of God. Before you even share your faith with somebody, you have got to fix this. Well, he didn't like that, and he never talked to me again. I had another man who once told me, as I asked him about these questions, I said, tell me about your relationship with your kids. He had a few teenage daughters. And I remember he'd gone to say uh, that he, he, he works all the time. He never really is around them or raises them or do anything with them. Sure, him and his wife are still married together in the home. But his teenagers, he has no idea their, their interests. He has no idea their hobbies. He has no idea what they're invested in with school. And as we wrestled with these things and talked with him, I said, how on earth can you expect other people to see you as a spiritual leader if your own kids do not. I had lunch with a husband and wife who've been struggling with years and years and years of, of financial uh, lack of stewardship. It wasn't the fact that they didn't make a lot, but they had been greatly is- irresponsible with how the Lord was trying to, to bring this wholeness into every aspect of their personal life. They had mounds of credit card debt, all these things. They were on the edge of eviction from their home. And I told them that their desire to serve the Lord is great, but understand is that you can't help others if you are drowning yourself. You can't walk into people's lives and expect to deliver peace when inside of you is nothing but sheer fear and sheer bankruptcy and all these things that are are decaying within your soul. Understand that this does not mean that we're disqualified from God's calling or purpose when we're going through hardship. It's not what I'm saying. A lot of the times, Casey, lo- Casey, I was thinking of your story earlier is what you were sharing. Like what Casey shared often or shared earlier, what is so important is that we experience hardship often in our life, but we allow the Lord to bring about purpose through that and through us here and now in our life. 
It's not the same thing of experiencing seasons or moments of hardship versus having a home life that is totally shattered. It's not the same. Know that you can only reach as high as you can as the stool you are standing on will let you reach. And if you step on that first step of that stool and it's already teetering and it's already rocking and rickety, my grandfather in his workshop had an old wooden ladder and I was terrified as a kid to ever step on it because it was one of those ladders that I'm pretty sure if you ever made it to the top, you'd find out how fast you'd fall down to the ground. It was, it was, it was, I'm like, Grandpa, I don't want to use this anymore. But he's like, oh, no, it's a trusty old ladder. Don't worry, it's fine. And he'd climb up it. And I'd be like, be ready to catch Grandpa quick, you know. But the truth of our home life is it is that first step, and if it already begins to wobble and creak, and it already seems like it's going to fall apart, we will not reach very far in life. Understand, this doesn't mean that we can't have wild ambitions and do great things for God. We can and we should aspire for all of that. But we need to assess our ambitions, and we need to recalibrate our goals in life because we have a tendency to care more about so many other things than worrying about the people who are closest to us. There's a habit that I've seen very much in our culture is that we live in a society where we really care more about impressing people who barely know us than those who are closest to us. And this is why we see in our Christian journey, people are good at, 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 at kind of the exterior modification of their life, but we lack the transformation of Christ in our interpersonal life because it's easy to hide. This is not the way of Jesus. It matters more to me as Andre, not the pastor of this church, but as Andre, that I have the respect of my wife and kids more than anyone else in the world. Gentlemen, seek out the praise and affirmation of those closest to you, not the ones who are on the edge who barely know you. Ladies, be generous with your affection and graciousness of your words. Understand that you cannot make a man respectable by disrespecting him. You can't build any man, whether you've been married to him for a long time or just dating him, you cannot build any man up to respectability by trying to tear him down with disrespect. It does not work that way. But understand that in all our, our relationships, in our interpersonal lives, in our home life, we have to, we have to become obsessed with allowing Christ to make these parts of us new. We have to. Because we, we need it. It is often the last thing we're concerned with and we should make it the first thing that we are obsessed with. It is good to wow others with our faith and, our, and, and, and it's great to, to see others uh, you know, look to us with spiritual guidance and counsel and all. And we should do that. Even if we're still growing and we're works in progress, we should be all of these things. But understand, understand that we cannot neglect this any further. Now, people may not get it. If you're perhaps a student whose parents don't love Jesus, that was me when I was a student. If you're perhaps in a relationship or in a home where you love the Lord, but, but no one else does, they may not understand it, but they should be able to see it. They should be able to know that about you. I love what Reverend Matthew Henry says as he writes a commentary on Judges. He says this as he speaks about Othniel and his kind of commentary on Othniel and why God called him. He writes, let the sin at home be conquered, that worst of enemies. And then enemies abroad will be more easily dealt with. We cannot neglect this. In our singleness, we have insecurities and identity struggles that Christ wants to bring confidence to and wholeness to. We need to let him. And we may in this season of one, or in this season of our life, be a family of one. But it may not always be that way. So allow the Lord to build in you right now a strong foundation. Because let me tell you, the greatest piece of advice I can give to anyone who is not married is that the person you marry has more to do with the amount of happiness you will experience in your life than the career you choose. 
You can pick a great career that you find fulfillment in and you make a lot of money in and you get to make a lot of difference in the world and understand you can do all of that. But if you choose to marry the wrong person, life will be more difficult than someone who makes less money but chose to join their life with the right person. Recently heard a story of a good family friend of ours, this young girl um, who's in her early 20s who had been dating this guy for, for, for years, for a while, and they were you know, already talking about getting engaged and marriage and all this stuff, but then out of nowhere, he begins to get involved with this religion that is not biblical Christianity. And as she was hearing him talk about some things, she said, this can't work. And even though they were dreaming about kids one day and where they live and getting married, she said, we have to break up because we're not equally yoked with one another. And I promise you that she will, as soon as we heard this story, we were cheering because it is so true. It is so true that when we enjoy our lives with other people and now we together are a team, we experience such heartache if we're not joined together in all the ways that God dreams for husband and wife to be joined together. This whole conversation about our home life is not and does not have to be a one-day thing. It is a right-now thing. It doesn't matter if you've walked down a path that you feel like you are too far gone or you've made too many mistakes in your family or relationships or whatever it may be. You can begin now. The great Dietrich Bonhoeffer, this gentleman who in the 20th century the Lord used to do some great things in the, in the Christian church through Nazi Germany and all the things that were happening as he was championing and helping so many people around the world. He had a very, very bold statement that he would say often, he must be ready. We must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. And friends, we have to start letting God interrupt our home life. We may be used to be things being a certain way. Even if we don't like it, we're used to them being a certain way. And we're afraid to see them change. We're afraid to be bold and outspoken about it. We're afraid of the unknown. But understand, we have to let God interrupt our plan. We have to let him interrupt our relationships that are hindering us from the likeness of Christ in our home. We have to let him interrupt the patterns and habits that we have that we are keeping hidden that the Lord said to let go and remove. We have to let him interrupt our career aspirations and let him interrupt our dreams and ambitions. He has to, we have to let him interrupt our parenting styles and the way that we raise our kids and raise the next generation and prepare them for the future doesn't mean that much of our dreams and aspirations are bad or different from God. But maybe there are things that we've been looking forward to that we've been holding in such high esteem that it has caused us to neglect so many other things. Perhaps it's time for a conversation between maybe you and the Lord or you and your spouse. Maybe you even in your home with your kids. And saying, you know, this part of our life is not honoring to God and we need to work on it together. We need to be in church every Sunday together, not one of us. We need to honor each other in front of our kids. I don't like the way we speak to each other in front of them. We need to build up relationships with our kids so we can empower them and prepare them for the future. We need to honor God with our money and all the ways that we handle it because there's so much stress in our life and we do not enjoy this. We need to honor God with our singleness and our dating relationships. We need to honor God in in all the ways of our home with our schedule and the things that we plan and the things that we do and our commitments and our time. Understand that this is not about making home life our new God. C.S. Lewis writes about this in the Screwtape Letters where throughout that book he creates this fictional story of of Satan pretending to give advice and counsel to all these lesser demons who would go and tempt and ruin people's lives. Well, one of the chapters as Satan is giving instruction to one of his lesser demons, he tells him to go and make this man worship his family. Make this woman worship her kids or her spouse. Then they'll stop worshiping 
God. Worshiping family sounds like a noble cause, but it is corrupt and it ruins us. Friends, I encourage you to begin to ask the question of what is next? What have you noticed the Lord has brought about in your home life in the last year? What are you dreaming for for the next year? Because let me ask you, if there is something occurring right now in your home life that you do not want there in 10 years, then why are you putting up with it for the next 10 weeks? While we should pray and be quiet and trust the Lord to work in ways that we cannot see it, understand that sometimes the next big God shift in our life will come through our boldness, not your silence. Life is too short and hell is too real. We cannot any longer be okay with the darkness that is existing in the places that should be saturated with light. Because the Lord wants to do great things in you, through your kids, through your husband, through your wife. The Lord wants to do some powerful things. But there are things happening right now that are hindering. So I encourage you, lean into the voice of God and say, Lord, what's the next little thing? Water has to reach to 212 degrees Fahrenheit for it to boil. It's a big jump to go from 80 degrees to 212. It goes from 80 to 81, 282, 283. So what does it look like for the next little move? The next little shift? Because there'll come a day when we all reach the end of our life. And the things that we will find great fulfillment in are families that we've gotten to create, the people that we've gotten to invest in over the years and raise up and help, It will be the relationships around us. And our influence in the world doesn't come through saying the right thing to fix somebody's problem. Our greatest influence is getting to be like Othniel and getting just to invite people into our life so they can see what wholeness looks like and dream for it and create for it on their own and then for them to do that with somebody else. So what is the next thing? How about we have this moment? Let's close our eyes together. Just be in a posture of listening.